When I first learned that this was going to be my topic for the day, I must confess, I was completely stymied. I mentioned it to a friend of mine, the eternal now, big. And she said, oh, Helen, she said, um, I just found this new cookbook. Just tell them to read this cookbook. I said, what's it called? She said, the How Not to Die cookbook. <laughs> and it's a vegan cookbook. And then I had another friend who said, oh, go back to William Blake, the great English poet who lived in the romantic age of poetry towards, well, over the uh, 1900s, 1800 and the 1900s. And, and I remembered that what she was talking about. I had to write it down because I'm not great with memorizing poems. But here's the poem. And it is perfect, but it doesn't take up more than two seconds. To see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower Hold infinity in the palm of the hand and eternity in the hour. And that's the goal, right? But how do we get there? And then I remembered another Blake poem. I was an English major in college. <laughs> and I do teach English to the middle school. And we do do poetry. And I remembered this other poem that seemed so right. So you'll have to bear with me with my poetry today. But you probably know it. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Symmetry, symmetry. There's discussion around that. And then it goes on. But you have the image of the tiger. And one might wonder, you know, why, why resort to a poet when you have all this beautiful teaching, spiritual teaching out there. When in fact, if you go do your homework, Blake was a mystic. He was the type of guy who could do anything. He reminds me of Swami Kriyananda. He wrote poetry. He did fantastic art. And he dove into the great spiritual mysteries that confront us every single day of our lives. And he had something to say about them. But he said it in his poetry. So later on, you know, in this poetry about this tiger who is fearful in symmetry, he talks about the creator who made the tiger. And he uses images, images of the hammer. These are strong images. The anvil, the chain, and he forges it in the fire. And he comes out with this ferocious tiger. Well, who is this tiger? He's us. He's our soul. And we have that side of us that has that wildness, that strength of character, of energy, the ability to overcome anything by the sheer force of our own natures, our soul natures. We have it. And that's what he's saying. And then, at the, almost at the very end, he says, he asks the creator, the, the narrator in the poem, he, sa he asks the question, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? And so we have the other side of the coin. Not only are we in our soul natured tigers, but we are also lambs with all the innocence and the humility and the love that a lamb conjures up in our images. So why does the tiger need to be so strong? Why can't we just get through life being the lamb, the lamb of God, the very image of Christ? And it really comes down to what our reading is telling us that we have to break through the veil of delusion because the goal is already there. We're already free if we only but knew it. And we have to raise our eyes to the point between the eyebrows and see that the harvest is there. But it's in knowing that and breaking through the illusion, the maya that holds us back to this more human reality, not the soul reality, um, that needs to be transformed. 
So I can only um, think when I talk about these, the soul qualities, in this case of fierceness or humility and lamb-likeness. I think about two weeks ago when I was standing on this very stage, and it was the end of school, I'm the school principal, and we were having our end-of-year ceremony. Now, a lot of times in end-of-year ceremonies, for those who might not know, um, there's a celebration of academic success and excellence, and people who have stood out are honored. But our ceremony is different because we're an education for life school. We're a school that, as Swami said, needs to prepare children to be happy. Not for Google and not for Facebook. (laughs) Happy. And so what we do is we celebrate their inner growth as it expresses in the form of various qualities. And we call it our quality ceremony. And each teacher offers up in a very special, one of the best faculty meetings of the whole year, a sense of the quality that they think their, chi- their children should receive. And it could be anything. It just has to be authentic. So if the child advances in self-confidence, that's what they get. Or it could be awareness. They begin to understand that there are other people's realities out there. Or it could be compassion or delight. I love the child who got up here one year and said, I received the quality of delight and I, di- I received it because I am delightful. <laughs> <laughs> Even the little kindergartners receive a quality and address a full auditorium by themselves in front of a mic. And the qualities go on and on. You name it, we have probably given it. But this year, and, and, and you might say, well, okay, that's like 30 seconds worth, but not really. Because those children take in that observation on the part of their teachers of how they have grown in their souls. And they put it in their pockets for the journey of life, or in their backpacks, more likely. And they have that. And when they meet adversity, they pull out the confidence. When they meet uh, a personality that they don't quite understand, they pull out awareness of someone else. Or if somebody is unkind to them, they pull out strength of heart and they move through it. They have it because it's been articulated. And this is such a profound ceremony with lifetime results. I know because my own children went to a living wisdom school and they remember their qualities. They're now mothers themselves. But there was one girl this year who received the quality, uh, her quality, and I won't say it right out loud because I'm going to read a little portion of her speech. I thought that this really, really exemplifies what we're about and what this reading is about. That if we're all aiming for that self-realization that is within, then we have to bring to the fore and develop all the qualities required for that journey. Ananta from the village says the journey is only three feet long from here to here. But then others can think of it as their life journey. So on her life journey, our little Vinka is uh, going to be able to reference this speech. She says, In middle school, Gary, our teacher, would write the whole class's qualities on the board. This is Gary. And we would guess which quality belongs to whom. When he wrote the quality truth seeker down, I immediately knew it was my quality. On our trip to Joshua Tree in Morro Bay, the sixth graders had a discussion about whether God is real. Even though I've been in this school since kindergarten, or around a thousand days already, I always had doubts that God existed. Gary helped me when he said that truth seekers always seek the truth and they don't believe in any religion until it's proven. Then I knew right away that I am not an atheist. I am a truth seeker. Isn't that beautiful? So touching. And then imagine 74 uh, little speeches just like that one 
with the same kind of profundity, the same kind of authenticity. So, while it's important to be fierce as a truth seeker on our journey to God and to really sort through things, to be fierce in our pursuit of that harvest that's already there waiting for us, the way in which we make that journey is also important. The fact uh, of just putting one foot in, in front of another won't do it. It has to be done in a spirit of transcendent joy. And I'm reminded, again, of a school play that we put on a few years ago of St. Bernadette. And I know many of you know her story. She was the young peasant girl in uh, the small village of Lourdes in, in France. And um, she had visions of Divine Mother. And the story is her, her family was so poor that they lived in a, an abandoned jail. They had hardly any money. Uh, they were really forced to forage to eat and to go out for wood to, to make the fire. So one day her mother said to the older children, I want you girls to go down to the river and get some firewood. And uh, Bernadette, who was very sickly as a child, said, oh, I want to go too. And her mother said, no, no, you can't go. And she said, she prevailed, so she went. And there, as the other two crossed the stream to get the firewood, she, wa she waited on the first side, and Our Lady appeared to her. And she went into this transcendent state. She reported on it later, but not until much later. And she had 15 appearances of Our Lady the lady said, come back. And she didn't know who it was. She just knew that it was so magnetic. It was so overflowing with joy that there was nothing that was going to keep her back. Even when her parents forbade it. And so she went. Well, long story short, uh, eventually pilgrims came and a sacred uh, stream, spring of water came up out of the earth and it turned out to be healing waters. And there, were all, there are, to this day, all kinds of scientific affirmations of inexplicable healings that have happened over the years and that continue to happen. Not all the time, some of the time. But that wasn't really the end of the story. We stopped it there because we were dealing with children. But you're not children. So the story goes on and Bernadette leaves her home and enters the convent. And she's going to become a nun. To become a nun, you go through what's called a novitiate. And you're a novice. And she has a, a, a novitiate mistress. So this nun is supposed to share her wisdom and her guidance with the young, usually young sisters, who come to join the monastic life. But in Bernadette's case, her novice mistress was her persecutor. Not only did she, was she persecuted when the city officials didn't believe her and tried to get her to renege that she had seen the beautiful lady. Her novice mistress, this very spiritually inclined person, humiliated her, excoriated her. Every chance she got. And Bernadette simply took it in until one day. Now, you can read the biographies. They don't really quite go into it this way. They mention it. But there's a movie out called Song of Bernadette that does a great job on this particular scene. So one day, the novice mistress, totally frustrated, comes to Bernadette and says, Why? Why you and not me? And she said, I come from a very highly re, uh, regaled family. I have credentials. I'm aristocratic. And she said, I'm a scholar. I study all the time. And every night I go into my cell and I take my scourge and I scourge myself. Which means she imitates Jesus being scourged by the Roman soldiers at the time of his crucifixion, as a way of penitence, a way for her to master the flesh. And she said, and then he chose you. 
or she chose you to appear to. And she just couldn't understand it. And Bernadette, in her way, said, I don't know why she chose me. She said, but maybe this would help you. And she just lifted up the hem of her habit to show this novice mistress what she had been experiencing, which was the advanced stage of bone cancer, which had broken through and was ever so painful. And her only acknowledgement of its presence in her body was to limp a little as she said her prayers. And in that moment, the novice mistress understood something and became her caregiver. And eventually Bernadette died. But why do I tell the story? Because that, in that, that story embodies the difference in uh, what used to be the acknowledged best way, best practice for finding God. And it involved self-abnegation. It involved penance. It involved shaming. It involved mortal sin. All those things that sometimes some of us grew up with. And uh, that wasn't Bernadette's model at all. So I read a book not, well, a couple of years ago about the Greek Orthodox Church, which was reevaluating its mores and understanding of scripture. And they found something that was extremely interesting and very relevant to what we're talking about here, which is how do we look up at the point between the eyebrows? In what spirit do we pursue our search for God? And in this book, it's a wonderful book, um, and it talks about the whole history of the Greek Orthodox Church, but there is this one point about the first translation of the Bible into the Greek, Coptic Greek. And the people who were translating it took the term metanoia, which means repentance, and they put that in as the translation for metanoia. And that word came all the way through all the other subsequent translations. Greek Orthodox, Catholic, King James Version, didn't matter. Metanoia, penance, and the shame that goes with that. And come to find out, when they went back to look at the originals, it was not contextually shame or penance, but rather it was transformation, change of mind, change of perspective. And along with transformation, it was transcendence. And think about that. That if you just go back to early American history and the puritanical approach and uh, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Remember that sermon? Some of you who've done your literature training. Um, that whole approach to, to the rigor of soul expansion and freedom came from something that was toward the negative, that was contractive, that was condemning. It was sad. And then now we have the other. And uh, the word transformation, with all that it implies, is so hopeful. It's a word that we can put in the backpack of our, on our journey to self-realization, because that's what we want. It's a change of mind, a change of attitude, a change of perspective that goes towards the highest instead of emphasizing the lowest. And that's what we give these children in our ceremony of qualities. We look to their highest, and it's something we must all do for ourselves. Because anything else is wasted energy, really. Why spend time thinking about all that is wrong or went wrong? The mistakes, the, the, uh, uh, the lack. That's to the negative. 
So when you do that, all of a sudden what comes into the equation is the element of joy. Transcendence, that rising up of energy, is just another way to talk about joy. Now I was uh, remembering when I first read the autobiography of a yogi, the chapter on the resurrection of Sri Yukteswar, many of you have read that, you might remember it. Um, In that chapter, Sri Yukteswar appears to Yogananda. And Yogananda was away when Yukteswar died. And um, he was in terrible mourning for his master, his guru. He hadn't been there, and he'd come all the way from the United States. He was making a visit back to his homeland, where his heart was, India. And then his master dies. So when Yukteswar appears to him, he just holds on to him. He won't let him go. Grip of iron. And Yukteswar remonstrates a little bit. But then in the course of their conversation, he begins to describe the eternal now. And he describes the afterworld, the astral world, and the causal world, and the melting in to the eternal now. Well, when I first read that book, I couldn't read it. I literally could not will myself, and I'm a good reader, to go through page by page, line by line, and try to take it in. It was too much for this little Catholic girl. Heaven, hell, and purgatory. And if you're a baby, limbo. And I just skipped it because I loved everything else. And I was so inspired. And then I read it again. And I read a little more, but it took me a few years before I could actually really sit with that chapter. And then it took a few more years until I realized how that chapter actually ended. Do you remember? So Yukteswar takes Yogananda through the astral world and all the beauty in the gardens and the joy of having melted into that arena. And then the causal world, which more, is more of a thought world. And then, of course, the eternal now, when the soul merges back in to the light. And at the very end, the chapter ends with a little story of the little woman who lived down the lane from the ashram, from uh, Sri Yukteswar's ashram. And she shows up at the ashram. Now, she was on the path Yukteswar would take after his morning walk to return to the ashram. And he would stop there. And he would talk to her. And he told her, that day, tonight, take a walk and go up to the ashram. And so she did. But the Swami who was then in charge said to her, oh, I'm so sorry, but Yukteswar died a week ago. Impossible, she said. I spoke to him this morning. He told me to come here. And she would not be persuaded. So the Swami took her to the garden where Yukteswar was buried. And, and then she knew. And he knew. And he said, oh, Ma, thank you. You have made me so happy. He said, he has risen. And he had risen. And he had given for us, along with Jesus and all the great ones, for us that model that we are in such hot pursuit of. But that model of wanting God wanting self-realization, wanting freedom, wanting the everlasting, the eternal now, that model requires energy, fierce energy, tiger energy. We can't just put one foot in front of the other and move through the days and hope that it's going to happen. We have to have those backpacks full of qualities that are going to get us there. Qualities like being that truth seeker. Qualities of joy. 
qualities of love, qualities of perseverance, getting up after you've been knocked down, making a mistake and leaving it behind. All of those are the qualities that we need in our backpacks. This is a a big topic. This is just scratching the surface. But the one piece of it that I hope you take is that no matter what kind of journey you're on, and they're all individual, every soul is individual, that no matter what kind of journey you're on, the most important thing is to take it with joy, that transcendent joy. Because only through joy will we make that three-foot trip up to the spiritual eye and out.